All right, good. Um, this is sharing a little bit of the story that goes along with editing a New Testament and since then working in ARSV. So some of it will get to the kind of issues of method that you've been starting to read about as you start semester. Some of it give a little broader stuff around. Let's just go for it. On April 1st, 2009, I received an invitation from Bob Buller, who is the head of SBL Press, to edit a new edition of the Greek New Testament. Now, for at least a few minutes, I have suspected my good friend was pulling an April Fool's joke on me, but in fact, it was legit. SBL wanted to sponsor a brand new edition of the Greek New Testament. Now, for me, this was a unique and exciting development. The text of the United Bible Societies and the NSA on the critical editions had been locked down, not changing at all for since 1970, uh, slightly longer than the duration of my entire professional career. And for all its excellent features, the UBS text had its faults and, in my opinion, significant methodological weakness. Any change was coming slowly in circumstances that did not present an opportunity for me to get involved in them. And so the invitation to edit a Greek New Testament was an unexpected opportunity. Um, there's, I'm already behind my slides. Sorry about that. But uh, there's a thing. It was an unexpected opportunity. Um, as my close friend Klaus Wachter would say, such an opportunity does not come twice in one's career. Uh, second, it was an ironic and intriguing opportunity in light of a paper I contributed to a conference that focused on editing in the Bible. In an essay entitled, What Text is Being Edited? I pointed out the introduction to the UBS text tells the reader nothing about its character. That is, what do its editors think it represents? An authorial text, the earliest circulating text, an early archetype of text, something else, it says nothing, it ignores the question. Meanwhile, individual members of the committee separately published differing opinions about this that shifted over time, which only added to the confusion. I ended the essay with these words. Those who use an edition of the text of the New Testament should not have to ask what text is being edited. Instead, one may suggest it is the obligation of the editors to answer that question. And now I was going to edit um, a New Testament myself. Would I, could I meet my own standard? And now the third uh, challenge was in view of the multiple players and audiences to consider whose interests and stakes intersected in multiple directions. Now, some of these intersections were obvious. Two publishers, each with different goals. For the SBL, the goal was The goal was to uh, create an electronic text of the New Testament that would be free for scholars and students to download and use. We do not envision a creation of a new critical edition. Rather, we seek only to create a standard, reliable text of the New Testament that scholars and students, especially those in under-resourced regions around the world, can freely use with confidence. This idea of free use around the world, an idea backed up by SBL's very generous end user agreement was for me a major attraction. SBL had in view, I think, a composite text, a text supported by a consensus of existing editions like the original Nestle text. Logos had its goals. They had more of a commercial tinge. They wanted a text that could serve as a reliable and royalty-free foundation for many products in their software line. Though in line with the SBL agreement, they also make it available free of charge. Now, besides two publishers with different goals, there are multiple potential audiences to think about, academic, secular, religious, all of whom needed to be taken into account. As for personal goals, I've sketched a bit already. To put the matter a bit differently, this was an opportunity to edit the Greek New Testament and do it right from both historical and methodological perspective. Indeed, this was one place where SBL goals changed along the way, and I ended up doing not just a composite text built from existing editions, as SBL first envisioned, but I did a new critical text, a brand new edition. So from the get-go, there was a mix of scholarly, commercial, and personal goals, and a fourth element was always in, in view, and in my mind at least, and that was the awareness of the potential for impact on the church, especially in light of the SBL goal to serve under-resourced regions. Now, editing the edition, the entire process 
was online. In 100%, we didn't print a single sheet of paper during the entire editorial process. Rick Brandon at Logos was key for this. We established a workflow and editing procedures that we followed during the process, during which we exchanged thousands of emails. Always following a single rule I had, only one question per email. This was the most energizing project I've ever worked on. I was putting in 10 to 13 hours a day. I had a sabbatical, so I had nothing else to do. But though I was putting in 13 hours a day, I was having to force myself to stop and go to bed. Despite the circumstance that often the reward for making a tough decision was the opportunity to make another tough decision, uh, the projects I seemed to pull along. I'd say to myself, I'll go to the end of the paragraph and stop. And then I'd look at it and see that just two more paragraphs would get me to the end of the chapter. And then I noticed the following chapter was a short one. And before I knew it, I'd worked an hour or two or three longer than I'd planned to work. It was just so energizing to work on that it was hard to stop. And despite the isolation of working alone in a very small study closet in the seminary library, four and a half feet by five and a half feet, uh, there were constant conversations going on in my head. For example, with Metzger and the UBS committee, that had put together UBS text. Mesco was my doctor father, so I, I knew him well. I would say to myself, what were you guys thinking on a certain decision? Or sometimes Mesco had written a minority opinion that lost the vote, but I agreed with. And I would say to myself, Bruce, we'll get it right this time. Or when I was reading a commentary, I would hear the author's voice as I'm reading Gordon Fee in particular. Uh, I knew Gordon well, we wrote books together and I could hear Gordon I'm reading Gordon's commentary, I'm going to hear him saying it in his voice, or Tom Wright or Jimmy Dunn. So I, I always felt like I had somebody in my head with me right there. Uh, how long did it take to edit the volume? My standard answer is 13 and a half months and 35 years. 13 and a half months to do the job and 35 years to get ready to do it in 13 and a half months. Uh, intersections uh, that I had to deal with. One was method and history. Would the SBO be another consensus text like the original 1898 Nestle, which was the original proposal, or would it be something else and which would better achieve the scholarly goal? After some discussion, I got clearance to depart from any of the four base texts where I felt it was necessary to do so in light of the evidence. This decision gave me the opportunity to implement systematically a different approach to New Testament textual criticism in particular, a different approach to the history of the text, a perspective influenced somewhat by Gunther Zuntz rather than Westcott and Hort. And here we touch on a key issue too often ignored in New Testament textual criticism, how one views the history of the transmission of the text. Historically, New Testament TC has talked a lot about method, but just as important is historical perspective that shapes how one uses the method. Now, I've already jumped ahead. We'll look at Westcott and Hort for a moment. This is a slide showing their view of the history of the text. Been deeply influential, and in fact, it was heavily influential on the UBS and Nestle Allen Committee. In their view, two lines of text extended from the early stage, one relatively pure, the neutral, and a Western strand affected by corruption. Hey, Mike, at some point, yeah. Can you go, go ahead a slide? I think we lost you. Um, we don't see anything. All right. There we there are. Go. Yep, there it is. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Thanks for catching that. Yep. All right. Two lines to send, a Western line and what they called the neutral line. And at some point, some Western corruption filtered into the branch of the other stream, creating the Alexandrian text, which is mostly neutral, but had a little Western corruption. And all of these fed into the Byzantine text, a composite made from existing textual streams. On this view, the Byzantine text alone could never preserve an original reading. See how that follows right there? The Byzantine's got no direct line. It's only going through the others. This is the view that decisively shaped the United Bible Society and the Nestle Allen text. Zuntz, on the other hand, had a very different view. From him, two streams emerged from an earth of copies, a Western stream and an Eastern stream with a couple of currents within it. And the two went their separate ways. Now there's two big implications here. First, variants with both Western and Eastern support were not Western corruptions in Eastern texts as Wessat and Hort argued, but early variants 
Western variants over here can't be Western corruption. There's no connection. They have to go back. The only meeting point is back at this early stage. So readings with both Western and Eastern support had to be early variants. Doesn't mean they're original, but they could be. And secondly, the Byzantine text alone could preserve an original reading that had been lost in the other streams. Not often perhaps, but always a possibility. My own approach is deeply influenced by Zuntz, and that is a major reason why the SBLGNT in the 6,934 variation units differs from the UBS Nestle Island about 9% of the time. In many of the cases that make up that 9% agrees with one or more of the other three texts that I use as a starting point. Uh, because some of them share with Zuntz a more positive assessment of the Byzantine text than Westcott and Hort. But in the end, there were 56 distinctive readings in the SBLGNT that did not match the text of any of the four comparison editions. Westcott, Hort, Tregellis, the Greek text behind the, well, basically the Nestle Alan and Robinson Pierpont. It ended up being a new critical edition rather than a composite edition. One more observation. The Zunzian perspective on textual history is very, very similar to perspective that is guiding the editors in the Editio Critica Mayor that's now in progress, an edition that will eventually replace the UBS New Testament. Another intersection, emendations. Um, what to do about emendations? An emendation is the attempt to fix or amend a place where a text appears to be defective. It's standard practice in classics but has always been controversial in New Testament studies. Let me give you an example. At 1 Corinthians 6.5, no English translation I know of actually translates this text, which, is, uh, which reads, judge between his brother. That's what the Greek has. Singular, one brother, not plural. The Greek word that is translated by between behaves the same way that the word between does in English. It requires two things to make sense, not one. The judge between a brother makes no more sense than to say to drive between Phoenix. You may drive through to Phoenix, through Phoenix, around Phoenix, or in Phoenix, but you don't drive between Phoenix. It requires a second location like Tucson. In short, something's missing from Paul's sentence. Now, this is what I think happened at a very early stage at the very earliest stage of copying, the copies I skipped from the end of the first Adelphu to the end of the second Adelphu, dropping out the three words that you see highlighted there. The restoration of Kai to Adelphu is an emendation, the correction of a fault in translation. Now this issue, whether to print an emendation touches on all the goals and audiences, especially with respect to what you might call reliability or at least perceptions of reliability. Uh, also a special with respect to acceptability, given the controversial uh, history of emendations in New Testament text or criticism. Some people don't think they're needed. Some people think that methods should never be practiced. It's just very controversial. In the end, I decided not to put any emendations in the text, although there are a few in the apparatus as the first option. I did that so nobody could blow it off and say, oh, there's emendations in it. I decided to leave them out. Now, what about the standard I set uh, that an editor should declare what sort of a text he or she has produced? Did I meet it? Yes, I did. And the intro is very clear on this point. And this is my answer. The SBLGNT represents the text in the form in which it first began to circulate and be copied. In other words, the point at which it was released into circulation. It went from being a private document to being a public document. That's what publication amounted to in the ancient world. This is the earliest text for which we have evidence, the text in the form in which it first circulated. So I did answer uh, my own challenge in that sense. Occasionally, I've been asked if the experience of editing the entire New Testament left affected my understanding of the history of the transmission of the New Testament. For the most part, I have to say it confirmed the views I started with. There's one area where the experience did bring out a clearer understanding of an idea that had been kicking around in my head for quite a while, an idea growing out of a long-standing debate regarding the stability 
of the New Testament text. In fact, there's a conference in 2008 on this very topic. Some participants argued the text was extremely stable, and others argued it was so unstable we have no idea what the author's copy looked like. And one or two of us staked out a position somewhere in between. Then a year later, I get the invitation to edit the Greek New Testament. In regard to this question, working through the entire te New Testament verse by verse, a level of comprehensiveness that one rarely has the opportunity to achieve, it did lead me to a clear understanding of what I refer to as the uh, micro level fluidity versus macro level stability. What was only a sketch in a conference presentation become a fully developed idea. Now the key idea is this, contrasting micro level fluidity with macro level stability. Let me give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about there. Uh, Matthew 15, 30, Jesus healed those who were lame, blind, maim, and mute. At least that's the order you find in Aleph 157, a few others. In all, there are, how many do I say right there? Uh, 14 different orders of these four words. 14 different orders. That's kind of astounding. In one sense, it's no big deal. The meaning of the episode is clear, but in another sense, it's remarkable that there are 14 different orders. And now catch this. In the next verse, Jesus, well, they brought to him the blame, blind, maim, and mute. And it says, he healed uh, the mute. He did this. There is no variation in the order of those four nouns in verse 31. You see it down there at the bottom, 4, 3, 1, 2. What do you notice about the order of the words in verse 30? None of the 14 versions of verse 30 match the sequence in verse 31. You're telling me no scribe looked ahead and matched verse 30 to 31 coming up? It didn't happen, and there are 14 or so. On this level, the stuff just explodes. Micro level fluidity. One more. Um, in Matthew 18, verses 10 to 19, six references to heaven in just 10 verses. The first three and the last one are textual stable. And the word is the heavens in the plural, no article. But in the other two instances, there are three variant readings, singular, no article, singular with article, plural with article. And the manuscript evidence is totally fragmented. Now, this is remarkable. Four of the six are textually stable. The other two are very unstable. And among the three variations, the stable one from the other six verses is the only one not present. This is just bizarre. It's hard to see it as anything other than purely random. Now, again, none of it affects the meaning, but you still wonder what's going on in the mind of what, how did the textual process work that you get this kind of fragmentation? Now, yes, they're exceptional cases, and I cited them to prove the point. Most variations are much smaller level, but it still gets the idea of micro level fluidity across. Now, macro level stability. At the same time, on a micro level, there's everywhere plenty of variability. There's corresponding evidence of macro level stability. There's an idea is exploring prior to the new test doing the SBLGNT, but as a working through the entire tradition, it left me a much deeper appreciation for it. Now, this is a topic that you read about in my chapter and original text. So I'm going to be very brief in regard to details. You've got them in my chapter. Uh, here's some examples of some unstable traditions. Jeremiah, the Hebrew and the Greek differ quite a bit. In fact, I'll jump ahead. Two tables. On the left hand, you've got the order of the Masoretic text. And in the right hand column, uh, that material set to it. So 47 in Hebrew is chapter 29 in Greek. 40. 8 is 31, 49 is 30, you like that, 29, 31, 30, folks? And then 50 is 27. Or if you turn around and go with the Greek, 29 in Greek is 47 in Hebrew, 30 is 49, 31 is 48, uh, 33 is 26. 29, 30, 31, 32, 33 is 47, 49, 48, 25, 26. Makes good sense, doesn't it? Uh, they're, they're different. Life of Adam and Eve, there are major differences in the copies in terms of what's included. It's the same story, but different forms of it. 
The Shepherd of Hermas apparently circulated in two early forms. Uh, there's a Jewish document, Sefer Yeshara, three recensions, clearly three forms of the same thing. They differ in length and in order of paragraphs. And then Pierce Plowman from the Middle Ages, three apparently authorial versions varying between 2,500 to 7,700 lines. So those are unstable traditions, macro level, major changes going on there. When you turn, come to the New Testament, look at Matthew. Take any manuscript of Matthew that survives, that we know of. The order and the number of paragraphs is invariant. Any omissions, inversions, additions involve two verses or less. Uh, for John, other than 750 to 811, which everybody knows about and is uh, clearly an oddball case, there are no paragraphs rearranged or omitted, and the longest edition involves less than two verses. Now, Acts in the Western text is somewhere, depending on what user you compare to base, about six and a half percent longer. And some episodes, like chapter 15, the Apostolic Decree, are clearly revised in the Western text. But for being six and a half percent longer, there's no addition, excision, or relocation of any episode or a paragraph. The macro level, of the thing is as stable as anything else. And you can say the same thing for uh, other documents as well. The rest of the New Testament, it's the same basic idea. Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, anybody else, it's very similar. Within a verse, you can have macro level fluidity. And if, all right, there it is, a phrase, a verse, a sentence, once in a while, a paragraph in Acts, but no paragraphs out of sequence. But there's macro level stability of the structure, arrangement, and content. You give me a page out of a manuscript, and we can identify whether that's a page from Matthew or Mark or Luke or whatever. The things are that stable that you don't have trouble figuring it out. Um, this was something I intuitively sensed for some time. But it was the experience of working systematically through the entire text of the New Testament, along with reading widely about other range of documents that gave me the observational evidence to document it this way. And this for me was an unanticipated bonus of the whole project was to be able to document this kind of stability on anything above about a two sentence level. Let me finish this section with a different kind of intersection, trying to explain what I was doing to fellow church members and other friends. Friends at church just didn't get what I was doing. When I said editing the Greek New Testament, they heard, oh, you're translating the New Testament into Greek. Uh, no, I'm working on a Greek text from which translations get made. Sorry, for, you know, they just didn't get it. One friend, however, a fellow author who understood what editing is all about, uh, more or less did get it. And after thoughtfully listening to my description of what I was doing, she paused a bit and then said with a grin, so it's like you're God's editor. You know, what can you say? Uh, no, I'm not God's editor, but she sure gave me a hard time about that. So there's a little bit about editing the Greek New Testament. I've given you a little bit of theory about textual history. You're going to read a lot of, a lot of other stuff. Let me give you some of the context of working on a project like that. Let's shift to another one that I've done since then and putting the Greek New Testament into a translation. Um, in mid 217, the same person who invited me to edit the SBL GNT asked if I would be interested in serving as the lead New Testament editor for an update of the NRSV. The goal was to replace the 1989 to update the 1989 translation in light of new developments regarding the Greek text and advances in philology. Now, inevitably, we ended up going a bit beyond our charge, but that was a basic goal. As for the text, having recently done the SBLGNT, of course I had lots of suggestions for updating the text, many of which were accepted by the editorial committee. You always got to get it by a committee. As for updating the language of the translation, let me share four areas that will illustrate what we're doing here. By the way, this will be coming out, I think it will get announced around the time of the SBL annual meeting and publishers will probably have it available for sale in January. The NRSV updated edition. 
Well, four areas we're going to look at improving the NRSV, trying to have the English match the emphases of the Greek, better conveying important lexical or stylistical features, and research resulting in more accurate translation. So let's dive in each of those. Improving the NRSV. Uh, sometimes it's vocab choice. That word demo, daimonizomai uh, or demoniac. There's 13 times the New Testament. In six cases, the NRSV translates someone possessed by demons, but in the other seven, it reads demoniac. I have no idea why. Metzger's long since passed away. I can't ask him. But the same Greek word is two clear ways to translate possessed by demons or demoniac. Not only is it striking inconsistent, but demoniac is an odd English word whose meaning is not obvious. Is it a demon or a person or some combination? In any case, it's not contemporary English. Its high point in English usage was in the mid 19th century, and it does not seem to have appeared in an English translation until 1898 and only rarely thereafter. Getting rid of demoniac increases the consistency of translation, eliminates an obsolete and obscure English term, and increases clarity. Uh, more accurate vocab choices. Paul uses four times all in Romans or Greek words syngenes, for which the lexicon gives two semantic ranges, belonging to the same extended family or clan, or belonging to the same people group, an extension of number one. In other words, it's a smaller group and a larger group. Of the 11 New Testament occurrences, the seven in the Gospels and Acts all fall under number one, the small group. The four cases in Romans all fall under the extended group, however. But this is not what the NRSV did with them. In 9.3, um, the NRSV reads, for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh, they are Israelites. There are actually two problems here. My own people translates uh, a Delphon mu, which is usually my brothers and sisters. And second, to get our main point, kindred according to the flesh translates syngenin mu, the term we're looking at here. Now, when was the last time outside of maybe Bible class or chapel, you heard the phrase kindred according to the flesh? It's just not contemporary English usage. And I would argue it's not really English, but more like Biblish. Now, the updated translation is going to read this. My own brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. Here an idiomatic English, English phrase, flesh and blood, renders an idiomatic use of the Greek term and retains its metaphoric use. Now, turning to chapter 16, Paul used in Guinness three times to describe his relationship to six people, all of whom are Jewish. Here, NRSV translates relatives with a footnote offering compatriots as an alternative. Relatives, however, in English is a small group term for what is in context a large group relationship. The translation is therefore open to potential misunderstanding, and the word compatriot has its own issues. I'm not sure anybody really knows what we mean by that. So the editors went back to chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, and took a cue from Paul's own words. When he referred to my own brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood, he said they are Israelites. How does Paul in himself, in himself, in effect, define Sungenon as Israelites? So that's what the revision will read here in chapter 16. Not my relatives, which is small group, but my fellow Israelites, which is a large group term. They're not members of a smaller clan, as relative would imply, but they're members of the larger group. So to summarize, none of these examples involves what you would call a major issue, but they illustrate the kind of small improvements that were made throughout the revision process, which cumulatively add to the clarity and the consistency of the revision. Now, trying to have the English match the emphases of the Greek. Greek, as you know, the word order is flexible. You can put the word at the end or the, the front or the back for emphasis You other things in English. We're a word order language, and it, it just emphasis works differently. Now, here's the NRSV of 1 Peter. Husbands, in the same way, show consideration for your wives and your life together, paying honor to the woman as the weaker sex, since they too are also heirs of the gracious gifts of life, so that nothing may hinder your prayers. Now, uh, 
Overall, the NRC is an improvement over the RSV, but it's still murky and several questions arise. What is the primary thing this, this verse appears to say about wives? That they are the weaker sex, that they are worthy of honor, that they're fellow heirs of life? What's the antecedent of the since clause? And what about the clause after the single dash? Which prior clause does it connect with? I don't think the answer to any of these questions is all that clear or obvious, especially regarding the since clause and a single dash, which basically functions as a comma. This lack of clarity suggests there's room for improvement. Now, I'm not saying this is the clearest thing that Peter has ever written either, but allowing for a little bit of simplification, the main structure is clear. There's a main verb, show consideration. There's an as clause. There's a as also clause. And the also signaling the second as is more important than the first as. And then there's a purpose clause, so that. And the purpose clause in Greek clearly links back to the main verb, show consideration, so that. So the main sentence is, the main idea, show consideration for your wives and your life together, so that nothing may hinder your prayers. Now, when I would ask my students which part of the verse they perceived as most important or most emphatic, it was almost always the phrase as the weaker sex. That was mentioned the most often. Clearly, the main emphases in Greek, which follow beginning and end, don't come across with the same emphasis in English, which depends heavily on word order. Instead, the first as clause is generally taken as the main point of emphasis in English. Show consideration as the weaker sex. And my students in adult classes overwhelmingly, that's how they heard the verse. Now, in light of all this, the, translation for the challenge for the revision committee is to try and figure out a way to structure the English sentence so that the emphasis in English would better reflect the emphasis of the Greek sentence structure. Now, here's what we did. Husbands, in the same way, show consider for your wives and your life together, paying honor to the woman, dash, though the weaker vessel, they are joint heirs of the gracious gift of life, Second dash, so that nothing may hinder your prayers. What's the main sentence? Show consideration so that nothing may hinder. There's the main part right there. And those two as clauses, which of the two in Greek is more important? The second one. That's what we've done here. Though the weaker vessel, they are joint heirs. Here, restructuring English sentence and its punctuation results in a translation that we hope emphasizes the same main point as the Greek sentence it translates. Another thing we're trying to do is to convey important lexical or stylistic features. Uh, my example will take start with 2 Corinthians. In chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, uh, lupe or lepeo, the, the Greek verb, that Greek word and its noun occur eight times. In chapter 7, verses 8 to 11, they occur eight times. These are the two clusters in the letter. And in 7, 8 to 11, he's clearly picking up the discussion back in chapter 2. Now, in the NRSV, they use as pain or cause pain or painful. And then in chapter 7, they use grief or cause grief. Which means the English reader has no clue that there are, there's some kind of connection here. It breaks the connection between the two passages that's confirmed by the explicit reference in 7, 8 to the letter that Paul mentions in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The book editors who worked on this made a solid case for translating all instances in both chapters by the same word. And they suggested that word should be grief. So we implemented the suggestion and changed all the pain or cause pain in chapter 1 to grief or cause grief with one major exception. What do you do with Paul's painful visit? There are two problems here. One was emotional attachment. It seems like everybody who's ever taken a course in the Pauline letters of 2 Corinthians has heard about Paul's famous painful visit, and none of the translators wanted to let it go. It just had warm overtones from their student years and everything. They, they couldn't get rid of it. The other trouble is linguistic. The noun and the verb of pain and grief are interchangeable. But what is the corresponding verb for painful? Griefful? You can't hardly even say the word. 
and to say another visit that caused grief was just too wordy in the whole thing. So what do we do? You talk with your colleagues. And in this case, uh, one of my colleagues came up with a solution. Uh, Peter, it was Juan. Yep. Um, Juan su suggested that Paul did not want to make another grief-inducing visit. <laughs> Bingo, we had our translation. It reads clearly. It gets the key word in there. Uh, it, it preserves the idea of Paul's painful visit. And an alert reader can now make the connection between chapter two and chapter seven, where the same word cluster turns up. Sometimes research resulted in a better translation. And my first example is, are the Hebrew and the Greek words that are traditionally translated leprosy. Since the King James, this has been the general translation of these terms. Leprosy, that is Hansen's disease. But research has made it increasingly clear that Hansen's disease was unknown in the Mediterranean world prior to the second century BCE. And moreover, the symptoms described in Leviticus 13 do not match those of Hansen's disease. Furthermore, once Hansen's disease did appear in the Mediterranean world, Greek and Roman writers use other terms such as elephantiasis to refer to it. Whatever the scriptures are talking about is something other than leprosy, Hansen's disease. Now, two modern translations have picked up on this, the C Contemporary English Bible and the Holman Christian Standard Bible. But curiously, in the Christian Standard Bible revision of the Holman Bible, they went back to using leprosy again. So there's only one translation out there, and now a second one, the NRC, has eliminated the word leprosy from the translation. It, Whatever it is, it's something else. It's not Hansen's disease. In Leviticus 13, the most common alternative is scale disease with a note at the bottom of the page, a term for several skin diseases, precise meaning uncertain. Uh, and in New Testament in 2 Kings 5, we simply use skin disease. And you'll notice more often it's a matter of uh, cleanliness regulations and disease that Jesus doesn't heal the person. He cleanses the person when this whole thing is turning up. So there's one place where more research has resulted in a translation that we hope will be maybe not more clear, but at least not as misleading as using leprosy in that spot. One more example, uh, Philippians 1.10. Here's my prayer that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best so that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless. And in the Greek phase, there's the ta diaferanta. Now, the large majority of translations are similar, rendering the key phrase as either approve what is excellent, King James, ESV, or approve what is severe, or determine what is best. Such translations sound both good and pious, but as soon as you begin to think about the statement, a question arises, excellent compared to what? Or perhaps best in what respect? Not only that, but the context provides no help in answering that obvious question. One may describe it as a translation of the Greek that obscures more than it clarifies. In any case, approving what is excellent or determining what is best has no clear connection with what follows in chapter one. Now, one enduring advance in the research of the Pauline letters over the last half centuries involved placing them in the context of ancient letter forms and genres. And perhaps nowhere has this paid off more than the case of Philippians, which is now widely recognized as a classic example of a letter of consolation. And one of the central elements of ancient consolation was differentiating between ta adiaphora and ta diaphoranta, things that do not matter versus things that do matter. Now apply this to Philippians 2 and 10, as two other translations have done. And it results in determining what is best becomes determine what really matters. Now, why is this revision no small matter? Whereas determines what is best has no apparent connection with what follows, I suggest that the translation determine what really matters unlocks the rest of the chapter. What is the Philippians problem in Paul's estimation? They have failed to discern what really matters in Paul's life in their own circumstances. They're allowing themselves to get all bent out of shape about things that do not matter, such as whether Paul, gospel is proclaimed out of false motives or true, whether Paul survives his current imprisonment or not, and whether the Philippians will ever see him again or not. 
And what is Paul's response in each case? Let's look at 118. I think I've got a slide coming here, maybe not. Uh, now back the other way, sorry. Um, 118, what does it matter Paul writes? Whether people are proclaiming Christ out of false or true motives, either way Christ is proclaimed. Verse 20, what really matters is not whether Paul lives or dies, but that Christ will be exalted. And then verse 27, what really matters is that the Philippians live their lives in a manner worthy of the gospel, so that whether Paul comes or doesn't come, they he will know they're standing firm in one spirit. One small change arising out of continuing research investigation helps unlock the passage of the letter. And not only that, it's a whole lot easier to think about it, applying it. Determine what is best. Well, that's hard to figure out because compared to what? This one, my board, my church board caught instantly ways of applying this one right there. So it's a small change, but I think it opens up the letter in this case. I hope that gives you some idea of what it's like to edit an edition of the Greek New Testament and to revise an English translation of it. It is a wonderful, challenging, difficult, thrilling, and humbling experience to navigate so many in in intersections between academy and church, and I'm grateful for both opportunities. I hope my comments give you some idea of the challenge that any editor or translator faces. We haven't talked so much about textual criticism, but it, textual criticism always has a goal serving a church through a translation generally. And this gives you some idea there. Thanks for the opportunity to share and blessings upon your semester.